Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners. So, we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Gregory Stockel, Katie Weaver, and Andrew Smith. Gregory and Katie tell us about a discussion related to using the water from the Tigris and Euphrates river system, Iraq and Turkey, are trying to decide how to share the water. Then, Andrew Smith brings us a story about a large land animal native to North America, the bison. After that, Faith Perlow and I have a story about how American colleges and universities are working to improve the mental health of their student athletes. And finally, a Thanksgiving week episode of Words and Their Stories from Ana Mateo. Be sure to keep listening after the story for a special conversation with Anna. And now, here are Gregory and Katie. The countries of Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and Iran share parts of the Tigris and Euphrates river system. The famous rivers are among the world's most vulnerable waterways. Water flow has fallen by 40% in the past 40 years as the four countries along their lengths seek to use the water for drinking, farming, and industry. Turkey and Iraq use most of the water. They agree that both countries must cooperate to protect the rivers. 60 million people depend on their water. But political problems and historical issues prevent an agreement. Recently, the Associated Press, or AP, spoke with people in Turkey and Iraq, including top officials and local farmers. The AP found that Iraq fears a possible 20% drop in food production in the coming years, while Turkey struggles to balance Iraq's and its own needs. I don't see a solution, said former Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al -Abadi. He said, would Turkey sacrifice its own interests, especially if that means that by giving more water to us, their farmers and people will suffer? Turkey has built 19 dams on the Euphrates and Tigris rivers and plans a total of 22. They are part of its southeastern Anatolia project, known as GAP. The project aims to develop the southeast, increase agriculture, and produce electricity. At first, Turkey planned to provide water for 1.8 million hectares of land. But that amount was reduced to 1.05 million. Half the reduced goal has been met. Farmers who receive water from GAP must use modern methods that Turkish officials say use two-thirds less water. But for Iraqis, every drop of water used for farming or other purposes in Turkey means less for Iraq. Iraq depends almost entirely for water on the two rivers that come from outside its borders. In 2014, Iraq's water ministry prepared a report that detailed what it called single truth. AP reporters have seen the report, which has not been made public. It said in two years, Iraq's water supply would no longer meet demand. It warned that by 2035, the lack of water would cause a 20% reduction in food production. The predictions can already be seen in 2022. Lakes have dried up, crops have failed, 
and thousands of Iraqis are moving away. Talks between Turkey and Iraq over many years have still not resulted in a long-term agreement. Turkey sees itself as the owner of the beginning of the river system. It considers needs and decides how much to let flow downstream. But Iraq considers ownership shared and wants a more permanent agreement with defined limits. Vesail Araglu represents Turkey on water issues with Iraq. He told the AP that Turkey cannot accept releasing a fixed amount of water because river flows are unpredictable. Araglu said Turkey could agree to setting a ratio release, but only if Syria and Iraq provide detailed information on their water usage. Turkey also finds it difficult to progress in the water talks because water officials from Iraq often change. Additionally, Turkey says Iraq must use water effectively. One Iraqi ambassador said it was a mistake that his side once told the Turks that Iraqis knew 70% of their water was wasted on ancient farming methods. This led Turkey to increase its demands for Iraq to reform. Iraq received an average flow of 625 cubic meters of water per second from the Tigris 10 years ago. Today, Iraqi water officials say the country gets only 36% of that because of less rainfall and a big dam in Turkey. Elisu Dam produces electricity, so water must be released downstream. But how much and when depend on Turkish officials. They must keep the reservoir water level at 500 meters above sea level to produce electricity. But they face less predictable water flow into the reservoir. Turkish officials say that with the dam, they can control the river flow to help Iraq by storing more water during floods and releasing water during dry periods. But Iraqi officials say they depend on one-time agreements with Turkey, which make planning difficult. They can cut water, they can release water. We urgently need a water agreement just to satisfy Iraq's minimum requirements, said Hatim Hamid. He is head of the National Center for Water Resources Management. Once Tigris River water reaches the Mosul Dam in Iraq, Hamid decides how much and where it goes in Iraq. With shortages expected in 2022, Hamid had to make big cuts. Water amounts for agriculture were cut in half. Those cuts reduced the amount of water entering the marshlands of southern Iraq. The result was an environmental emergency. Not enough water was entering the marshes to wash away salt from the ocean. Hamid tried to fix the problem, but the damage was done. In the Chebeish marshes, dead animals float near the sides of the river, poisoned by the salty water. Over the past two years, what was once green and full of life in the marshes has died and turned yellow. Salt from the sea has built up from two years without enough fresh water from the river. Obeid Hafez, a farmer, once planted more than 1,000 hectares of wheat. Today, his land in southern Iraq is without life, and his sons have gone looking for work in the cities. Life has ended here, he said. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Gregory Stockel. Native American tribes are leading efforts to bring back bison across North America, where they were once hunted to near extinction 
in the late 19th century. Tens of millions of bison, also known as American buffalo, once lived on the Great Plains of the United States and Canada. Many Native American tribes needed the animal to survive. They ate the bison's meat, used its bones for tools and weapons, and made clothing and housing, called teepees, from its hide. European settlers turned killing bison into an industry. They used animal parts in machinery, fertilizer, and clothing. By 1889, few bison remained, about 800 animals in the wild and 250 in zoos and private ownership. U.S. Interior Secretary Deb Haaland is the first Native American to serve in the cabinet. She told the Associated Press, We wanted to populate the western half of the United States because there were so many people in the east. The thinking at the time, she added, was, If we kill off the buffalo, the Indians will die. They won't have anything to eat. Now, 82 tribes across the U.S. have more than 20,000 bison in 65 herds. And that number has been growing, along with the desire among Native Americans to look after the animal that their ancestors depended upon for thousands of years. The long-term dream for some Native Americans is to return bison to the large numbers that once shaped the landscape itself. Troy Heinert is a South Dakota state senator and director of the Intertribal Buffalo Council. His goal is to get bison to tribes that want them, whether two or two hundred. This autumn, Heinert's group has moved 2,041 bison to 22 tribes in 10 states. He said, All of these tribes relied on them at some point, whether that was for food or shelter or ceremonies. Others have greater desires. The Blackfeet in the American state of Montana and tribes in Alberta, Canada, want to establish a herd that crosses the two nations' borders near Glacier National Park. Other tribes propose a buffalo commons on federal lands in central Montana, where tribes in the area could harvest the animals. What would it look like to have 30 million buffalo in North America again? said Christina Mormaruni, a Metis Indian who has worked with the Blackfeet to bring back the bison. Halland said, There is no going back completely. Too many fences and houses. But her agency has become a primary bison source, transferring more than 20,000 to tribes and tribal organizations over 20 years. Some cattle farmers are against the plan to move bison. They worry the animals carry diseases and compete for grass. But bison demand from the tribes is growing, and Hallen said transfers will continue. About 1,000 bison were transferred this year from Badlands, Grand Canyon National Park, and several national wildlife refuges. 
Some tribes are reintroducing traditional ways of harvesting bison. But today, few people have the skills to harvest them. In South Dakota this October, Katrina Fuller helped guide a group to harvest bison by cutting one into smaller pieces. She dreams of teaching others so more communities can harvest the animals. Tribal elder Duane Hollow Hornbear is 73. He said the harvest brings back what was almost totally taken away. His people's culture, economy, and social connection. It's like coming home to a way of life, he said. I'm Andrew Smith. Late last summer, two football players at Indiana State University were killed in a car crash. Just over one week ago, three football players at the University of Virginia were killed when they were shot by a former teammate. In both cases, university leaders needed to make a plan to support the teammates and friends of the students who died. Sherard Klinksdale is the director of athletics, or sports, at Indiana State. He had to find ways to help the students work through their sadness. He also had the difficult job of telling the football coach and the parents of the students that their children had died. There is no playbook for something like this, Clinksdale said. At the University of Virginia, Carla Williams has the top athletic job. When the news came out that the students were killed on November 14th, the university canceled classes and other school activities for two days. The school did not play its next football game either. Mental health professionals and dogs trained to offer comfort were made available to students. Williams said it was important to make counselors available for all students, not only the ones who were part of the sports team. In recent years, sports leaders at universities say they have paid more attention to the mental health of their students. A study done in 2019 showed that college presidents were also paying more attention to student mental health. But in 2021, a survey of college athletes found that only 53% of those questioned, thought their coaches took mental health seriously. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA, oversees college sports in the U.S. It does not have the power to make colleges change their mental health policies, but it does offer tools the schools can use to help students. Sunday Henry is a doctor who works with students at Washington State University. She helped the football team there deal with the deaths of players in 2018 and 2019. Henry said the first part of the plan is to bring together all of the team members to tell them what happened and the ways they can get help. She said she thinks college football coaches are getting better at urging their athletes to get mental health help. In the past, some players and coaches believed getting help was a sign of weakness. Henry also said the athletic trainers are usually the best at noticing athletes who are having problems. The trainers spend a lot of time with the students 
who are recovering from injuries. Tony Elliott is the University of Virginia football coach. He said he wanted to support his players. He added, "Nothing can prepare you for this situation." Brian Blair is the athletic director at the University of Toledo in Ohio. He worked in sports at Washington State University when the players there died. Blair said many of the adults in the sports department took a class called mental health first aid. He said the adults who work in college sports, who often have contact with students, should be a resource to the student athletes. Kurt Mallory is the football coach at Indiana State. He said he makes time each Monday to meet with his student athletes, even if it seems like they are doing okay. At California's San Jose State University, coaches had to react to the death of a player who was hit by a bus in October. The next football game. Was postponed. The football coaches worked to help the student's family and plan a memorial. The following week, the school played its game and won. The player who died, Camden McWright, was honored during a special ceremony. His family was there. To see the memorial, Jeff Konya is the school's athletic director. He watched over the sports teams that week. He has worked in college sports for thirty-six years. In that time, he said, college sports leaders have gotten better at prioritizing mental health. We are in a better position now," he said. He noted, however, that things still can go wrong. It is not foolproof," Konya said. "I'm Faith Perlow, and I'm Dan Friedel. And now, words and their stories. From VOA Learning English, on this program we explore words and expressions in the English language. We give examples and notes on usage. Today we talk about a word connected to Thanksgiving. One of the traditional images of Thanksgiving. Is something called a cornucopia. This is a container shaped like a goat's horn, and it is overflowing with many kinds of fruits and vegetables, such as gourds, ears of corn, apples, and grapes. So sometimes we call it a horn of plenty. Plenty means to have a large amount of something. For example, if you live in the land of plenty, you live in an area with lots of resources, natural as well as social and financial. But let's get back to the word cornucopia. This word describes a large amount or supply of something. For example, the holiday table held a cornucopia of food and drink. Anything you could possibly want for dinner was available. While the image of a cornucopia involves food, we use it for an abundance of good things. If something is abundant, there is plenty of it. Here is another example. A recent gathering offered a cornucopia of jobs from many industries. Representatives from more than two hundred companies 
were there offering jobs. There was something for everyone. Sometimes the word cornucopia means there is an unexhaustible supply of something. If you exhaust something, you use it all up. So if something is inexhaustible, it seems limitless, like a bottomless pit. For example, a library is a cornucopia of knowledge. I could go into a library every day for the rest of my life and learn something new. These examples have an abundance of good things: food, jobs, and knowledge. We do not use the word cornucopia to describe an abundance of bad things. Also note, we often add a prepositional phrase to explain what type of cornucopia it is. A cornucopia of food, a cornucopia of jobs, or a cornucopia of knowledge. Now let's say that for whatever reason you are not a fan of the word cornucopia. In the examples with jobs and knowledge, you could easily replace cornucopia with wealth. In the food example, however, I would replace it with abundance or even bounty. And that's the end of this words and their stories. Don't forget to check out other programs at VOA Learning English. Our website is a cornucopia of English learning materials. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Thank you, Ana. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English broadcast. By now, everyone listening knows plenty about the word cornucopia. We are joined now by one person who knows a lot about American sayings, Ana Mateo. Welcome, Ana. Thanks, Dan. I'm happy to join you. Great to have you back on the program. So. It is just days after the American Thanksgiving holiday. At my Thanksgiving, we had a lot of cranberries. We had cranberries in salad and cranberries in our dessert. What did you have in abundance? Vegetables, veggie gravy, roasted cauliflower and broccoli, a green salad, green beans. So my Thanksgiving was a cornucopia of vegetables. Wow. That sounds like a healthy Thanksgiving to me, Anna. You and I enjoyed quite a bit of good food on Thursday. How are you planning to recover from the big celebration? I always take a long walk with my family. Thanks, Anna. That sounds like a great way to get ready for the new week. See you soon. You're welcome, Dan. And that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Thank you for listening. Thanks also to my colleagues Anna Mateo, Gregory Stockel, Katie Weaver, Andrew Smith, and Faith Perlo. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from around the world. I'm Dan Friedel.